The wine in Alabama was like just last year or the year before, there was something about three sisters who were um, engaged from a very child, very, very, very um, young child of his age, to three brothers in another family, which was few. And when the girls grew up, and they are now, they don't want to marry them. And the parents are trying to force them to marry them to stop the feuding. And the girl is saying, no, we don't want to marry them. The Islamic position is that the girls are the bondage. There is no compulsion in religion. You can't force them to do something which Allah has not said. Another possibility is that you don't find people in this country who are practicing Islam in the way that it was practiced back in the home towns. And so they go back to their villages to get married. Unfortunately, in general, they can't find someone at the same educational level. So what's happening is that they're bringing people in who do not have a high educational level, and some places don't even know English. One of the reasons for the citizens of the Okay. And now, right at the point. There's a practice where a young girl is married to the Quran on the basis that she will be a spinster for all her life. No one can approach her. And the, the real idea is that the property belonging to the family doesn't go out of the family. Is it Islamic? Of course it is not. The other possibility is that they want to keep the bloodline pure. They don't want people marrying into the family and putting some sort of contamination in the bloodline. Okay. I take that myself, um, that it's very difficult to go back centuries in a bloodline these days. Okay. So I don't take that too seriously. That's what I said about that. And now you've got mutilations. A lot has been made of female genital mutilation. And most of it is on the basis of a statement or a tradition attributed at the time of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, where a woman came to him and said that she wanted to perform it. And she was going to do it regardless. This was in Medina, soon after he went. And she, she was going to do it regardless of what he said. And he told her, if you must do it, make it mean. And this is actually quite a weak tradition. But this is the only reference that we have, and some people use this as a reference that it is condemned in Islam. In Egypt it was a practice. They gradually strengthened that argument, and now they've come up and they're actually banning it. But in, in all honesty, it's a practice that comes from outside of Islam and before the time of Islam. It's still practiced in Somalia, for instance, or with Somalians, maybe not just in Somalia, okay? and a few other places. But it is not Islam. Can anyone tell me if you're not supposed to pluck your eyebrows to give a different shape? to change your features. Why would you do something like this? And how could you say that doing it is Islamic? How could anyone understanding the global perspective of Islam say that this is the situation and it's Islam? It obviously is not. Let's move on. Let's move on. That's it. Now, no, go back. It's difficult for girls in the West to find husbands. Okay? We don't have the, the matchmaker in every case, okay? So now we're finding it difficult. And at the time of Umar, you know, I'll be pleased with him. What he said was that the community has to find their solutions to the problems. And therefore they should marry within the community. Okay? Which is not really what's being done today. But again, we don't have the community actually trying to solve their own problems. They won't even work together. Where are the problems coming up in the mosque? Where are the imams talking about them? 
I'm wearing and giving the advice to solve the problems. Stable societies are based on stable families. Women are a crucial pillar of family life. Critical. So much so that in Islam we say that the next generation is the responsibility of the mother. The current generation is the responsibility of the father. Women in Islam are rewarded for being good, they're protected, they're respected, they're provided for, and they're helped them too much. Now, just before I come to this slide, I want to say one other thing to you. All the West stresses is rights, human rights, my rights, prisoners' rights, child's rights, everyone's rights. Where are the obligations? Where are the obligations? Why are they never mentioned? We've got all these civil rights groups. We've got all these feminist actions. Why? For the life of me, I do not understand why women's problems were separated from humanity's problems. Wouldn't we solve the issues better if we tackled humanity's problems? And wouldn't we solve the rights problems if we looked at rights and obligations? If an intending criminal has rights after he's perpetrated the crime, didn't the society have rights before he perpetrated the crime? Where is the talk about it? We talk about children's rights. What about parents' rights? We talk about children's obligations. What about parents' obligations? What about husbands' obligations? What about wife's obligations and wife's rights? All of these are covered in the Quran. Because there's a reciprocal movement in Islam, and that is that the rights of one are the obligations of the other. Each one of us has obligations to the environment, for instance, in Islam. To the resources, not to waste water, and so on. Each one of us has those obligations. We have rights as well. In a state, an Islamic state, the ruler has rights on the subjects. But also, the subject has a right on the ruler, and those rights of the ruler are the obligations of the ruler. For instance, education, security, health, employment. But we don't talk about rights and obligations when you talk about them. We don't talk about humanity. We talk about gender. We talk about women's rights. But why don't we talk about humanity? Perhaps you can think of some of the rights you've not mentioned. You might like to think about duties. And we'll ask many questions later. Thanks. Okay. Assalamu alaikum.